Gresham College presents Debussy, Text and Ideas Debussy's Wave, Debussy, Hokusai and La Mer by Dr Mary Brenner, University of Edinburgh I'm going to start with an anecdote. Toscanini, it's often said, was notoriously bad at communicating to his musicians how he wanted them to play something and he was endlessly frustrated by the problems this created for him. Once, during a rehearsal of La Mer, he found himself lost for words, as it were, and he, he couldn't describe what he wanted, and he stood in front of the orchestra silently, uh, looking at the floor, deep in thought, and then he took a silk handkerchief out of his breast pocket, and he threw it up in the air, as far as it would go, and he watched with the musicians mesmerized as the thing floated to the floor and sat silently. And he said, there, play it like that. <laughs> Whether the story is true or not is not really what matters to me. What matters is the wordlessness of the communication. And I can't and don't resist the temptation to see in the wave on the cover of the 1905 edition of La Mer a kind of premonition of uh, Toscanini's difficulties and those of his fellow conductors and even perhaps of the handkerchief. But now I want to step back from speculation and deal in hard fact. And my main purpose in the next few minutes is to put the subject in context. Debussy's cover, in certain ways, is emblematic of the aesthetic known now as Japonisme. And it was called uh, Japonisme, or uh, uh, in the case of this uh, print, the esthétique japonisante, and it was called that by Philippe Burtier in a se series of articles published between May 1872 and February 1873 in the journal Renaissance Littéraire et Artistique. Some years before, in 1866, Burtier had published a book entitled Chef d'œuvre des arts industriels in which he declared that the drawings and sketches in Hokusai's manga were comparable to the work of several European masters. They were, he said, as elegant as Watteau, as energetic as Daumier, as fantastical as Goya, and as full of movement as Delacroix. Burti was just one of an ever-increasing number of people, including not just art critics and painters, but also musicians and writers, who found in Japanese art a lightness and fluidity of line, a brilliance of color, and also a sense of energy and movement and fluidity that was lacking in the so-called academic or académique and realist painting of the time. And I've got an example. Oh. <coughs> this is the kind of thing uh, I'm talking about. And that, I'm not sure of the date of it, but you see that he died in 1905. And it is also called the wave. So that is an example of the kind of realist art that people were reacting against. The art from the East seemed to these painters to breathe differently, or rather to these artists. To quote Jean-Michel Nec uh, Jean Nectou, uh, I'm not very good at this. I put the quotation in, in uh, French on the overhead, but I'll um, try to translate it. The uh, vivacity of the colors of the uh, uh, prints of Ukiyoi, don't know how to pronounce it really, uh, the sure-footedness and audacity of these comp compositions, the absence of perspective and of shaping, cruelly underlined the leaden naturalism of so many bourgeois paintings 
and it encouraged the, mo the, uh, most, uh, the tendencies of the most advanced uh, thinking artists, or the most innovative uh, painters, including the Impressionists, the Nabi in particular. More generally, the lesson to be learned from the uh, uh, art of Japan, which was palpable in architecture as it was in everyday objects, in gardens, in drawing, in print or in poetry, coincided or uh, responded to the desire for oneness and of pur purity that uh, animated the artisans of Art Nouveau, as it did the painters and the poets who were the most advanced, the most progressive of their time. And it, that included uh, Claude Debussy, who was, according to Nectou, one of the very few, if not the only, uh, musicians. Musician, sorry. And it kindled the uh, fervent aestheticism of the symbolist uh, milieu in Paris, where the dream was of uh, an art of, uh, of every day. This is, of course, the Art Nouveau. Debussy's singularity in this uh, context is no surprise. What I'm going to do now is to briefly explore this uh, uh, esthétique japonisante, or the japonisme, and to uh, put, it, put his action in choosing this uh, cover for La Mer in context. I've become convinced in approaching or in uh, researching this paper that to approach La Mer from the perspective of what were called Debussy's Japonisant tendencies has the potential to deepen our understanding of his artistic thinking and in particular of his perception and intention in writing La Mer. Until relatively recently, the idea that Japanese art had become known in France in the late 1850s, that is around the time of the trade, they signed the, a trade treaty between uh, France and Japan in 1858, that idea persisted. And according to the version of events uh, that um, people accepted and uh, to, a, to a certain extent believed, Félix Braquemont, who's best known, and I'll show you that just for, uh, again to put the influence in context, that is a part of the uh, Service Rousseau, which was ordered by somebody called Rousseau, uh, that Braquemont uh, decorated, and that, uh, part of the reason that I chose that was because of the fish on the dish is very much like the poisson d'or in the print that uh, Debussy also attached a great deal of, well, was extremely uh, fond of and wrote his uh, poisson d'or. Uh, so, Braquemont was supposed to have more or less discovered the Japanese print when he found a copy of Hokusai's manga used as packing in a shipment published, uh, delivered in, to his printer. And it seems that Braquemont himself uh, told Léon Bénédit, uh, and Léon Bénédit published this information in a series of articles about Braquemont in uh, 1905, in, it must have been 1800. Sorry, I've got the, it. It must have been 1950. 1850. I'm terrible about dates. I'm sorry. Um, despite despite uh, considerable skepticism, even cynicism on the part of scholars, this account of things gained credence, and that was partly due to the fact, of course, that Japan had re had remained closed to the West by and large, apart from the fact that the um, well, uh, uh, links remained open uh, with uh, Holland, and that was the, in a way, that's the source of the piece of information that I'm going to uh, um, impart now, is uh, that uh, it had remained closed for almost 300 years, but in recent times, art historians agree, and as far as I can tell, are uh, sure, 
that the view presented in 1982 by an American scholar, Deborah Johnson, was that the Bachmann Benedict version of events must finally be dismissed as apocryphal. <coughs> Significant evidence can be adduced to prove that a range of Japanese prints was publicly accessible in the West a full 40 years before Bachmann's alleged discovery. These were dispersed throughout Europe, in France, England, Sweden, and the Netherlands, and generally available for viewing by 1840. As far as Debussy is concerned, clearly given the date, it doesn't change a great deal. On the other hand, Johnson readily concedes that although it's not possible to postulate with confidence, as she says, a, a direct influence of ukiyo-e on Western art early in the 19th century, yet the fact that the material was in circulation and was fairly widely known is not without significance. Given the ever-increasing interest in other cultures that was prevalent at the time, such material was bound to generate, again I quote, a keen and growing awareness of its presence and of its aesthetic. This in turn must lead, to, uh, lead us to revise our understanding of the nature and genesis of Japonism. What has been called the effective discovery of Japanese prints in the West must be cast as an inexplicable, instantaneous acceptance of a radically new aesthetic. On the contrary, the revolution of 1860 can be explained much more convincingly as the final absorption of an aesthetic that had been seeping slowly into the collective artistic consciousness for nearly half a century. Debussy was better than most at such absorption. And even if we don't know much about the earlier years, his interest in Japanese, in, in Japanese art and artifacts during his time in Rome is very clearly documented. As Nectu writes, on observe que son goût japonisant s'impose comme un trait de personnalité dès ses années romaines. So it's clear that his uh, uh, taste for Japanese uh, art and artifacts became a trait of his personality and I find that a very interesting uh, way of looking at the extent to which this uh, influence had in a sense seeped in to, uh, to Debussy by this time. Gabriel Pierny, whose time at the uh, uh, Villa Medici overlapped with Debussy's, tells how Debussy spent his time rummaging in the city's antique shops. Bien que vivant côte à côte, il n'y eut pas entre lui et ses camarades de véritable intimité. So there was no real uh, in, um, intimacy between him and his uh, fellow um, pensionnaires at the uh, Villa Medici. He, he remained solitary and he avoided our company, so Pierre Ney says. He uh, went out a great deal, and he spent a lot of time in the antique shops at, in Rome, and he uh, made what uh, Pierre Ney calls une véritable rafle de minuscule objet japonais qui le ravissait. So he, he gathered together in a, um, a very uh, extensive collection of tiny objects, uh, um, of Japanese objects, by which he was totally uh, charmed. And these années romaines were also the years of his friendship with one of the great collectors of Japanese art, Count Giuseppe Primoli. Primoli was a well-known photographer, but also a wealthy aristocrat, a nephew of the Princess Mathilde, a member of the Bonaparte uh, um, dynasty, and the owner of a residence at Fiumicino, where Chino, uh, sorry, uh, Fiumicino, uh, which Nectu describes as un vrai temple des arts et de la pensée, a temple of art and thought. Debussy became a frequent visitor there during his time at the Villa Medici, and he would therefore have had access not only to the largest collection of votos in Europe, and it's to uh, Richard that I owe that um, uh, 
comment, but to a fine collection of kakamonos, which are Japanese paintings on paper or on silk that were displayed as wall hangings. And from this time on, there's ample evidence of Debussy's active interest in East Eastern art. We only have to think of his reaction to the gamelan in the Ex Exposition Universelle of 1889, or the famous photograph of him with the young Stravinsky. Uh, I think, yes, there it is. Uh, taken in his study, in Debussy's study in 1910, perhaps taken by Satie, uh, but uh, that's only perhaps. And on the wall behind them, I don't know if you can see, but uh, on the wall behind them is the wave, and underneath it, uh, a wonderful Utamaro, which uh, are both in um, Nectu's book, has wonderful reproductions of them, and they're, they're uh, uh, worth a look, because you can't really see that, and I couldn't find one where you could see the wave. Uh, and though... As I've said, and others have said so many times, we've no hard evidence to show that it's the case. It seems quite possible to me that Debussy's knowledge of and interest in Japanese art predated his time in Rome and his friendship with Primoli. Indeed, I find it hard to imagine it didn't predate it, given his, re his lively interest in arts other than music, that from a very early age, and his extraordinary, incomparable aesthetic awareness. Living in Paris and associating as he did from an early age with artists and intellectuals, he would have had myriad opportunities to see some of the most significant collections that had been assembled. The collections of Siegfried Bing, Philippe Burti, whom I mentioned earlier, and Théophile Duré, at, at the 1878 Exposition Universelle, I know it's a bit early, but even so. And in 1883, the ret retrospective exhibition of uh, Japanese art uh, organized by Louis Gons at the Galerie Georges Petit. Gons, who was then the chief editor of the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, and in the aftermath of the exhibition, he published a sumptuous book, a very important book called L'Art uh, uh, Japonais, which, in a less sumptuous form, is still in print. So all of these things uh, come together to suggest to me that uh, Debussy may very well have uh, his, his acquaintance with uh, um, Japanese art uh, may have um, been there even before he met uh, Primo Lee and his collection. For the so-called Japonisant, uh, critics, Hokusai was in a class apart. Gons went so far as to say that he, was, that he bore comparison to such European artists as Rembrandt, Corot, Goya, and Daumier. And in a pioneering study published two years after Gons' book in 1885, Dury, whom I mentioned a moment ago, described Hokusai as the greatest artist that Japan had produced. Significantly, Duré called his book Critique d'avant-garde, d'avant-garde. And if some of this praise heaped on Hokusai seems somewhat exaggerated, Gons's comparison, in fact, between uh, Hokusai and these uh, European greats um, provoked uh, a, a considerable um, hilarity at this uh, side of the channel. But it also served to establish Hokusai's reputation in France and placed him firmly at the forefront of progressive aesthetic thinking. By the time Debussy came to write La Mer, the enthusiasm for Japonisme was in fact on the wane. But its influence prevailed and remained palpable, as Nick Tu reminds us, in successive generations of avant-garde artists right up to the period of the Art Nouveau. And in fact, I think I'm right, but I'm, I, I, uh, I'll just mention it. I, I certainly have come across a reference, and I think it was in a letter, that Debussy said, although he said, uh, um, said he, was, he was remaining faithful to the Japonisant, to the esthétique Japonisant. He, it was still something that uh, was important to him. Whether it was something someone said about him or whether it was something he said himself, I can't be sure. Now, 
so it seems that the, this aspect, that the aspect of Jap Japanese art that artists and critics were most struck by was what they saw as a forthright rejection of symmetrical repetition. And his fellow critic, Baabout Duré, who incidentally became recognized as the first uh, Hokusai expert, Booth Duré and his uh, fellow critic Ernest Chinou comment at some length on this. For Duré, in his Critique d'avant-garde, Japanese artists followed their caprice and abandoned themselves to fantasy, freely throwing around decorative motifs without any apparent system. I think that's probably uh, just a reference to the um, uh, manga. But in fact, it's said without any hint of criticism. On the contrary, in fact, he goes on to say quite emphatically that the artists achieved results that were visually satisfying. And they did so because they had what he called a secret instinct for proportion. For Shenu, the absence of symmetry was the salient characteristic of Japanese art as a whole. And he had a word for, he had a word for it, people say he invented it. The word is dissymétrie. And it was for him synonymous with Japanese aesthetics. The word is striking and warrants some comment. I certainly, um, I tried, uh, it, it became a kind of a barrier. So I'll give you what uh, I found about it. In both French and English dictionaries, I found that while asymmetry is given as a synonym for dissymmetry, the reverse is not the case. Asymmetry is explained quite simply as the absence of symmetry. Dissymmetry, on the other hand, has two explanations. The first, a lack of symmetry, not absence of, but lack of. Already the implications are different. And the second explanation given is the symmetrical relation of mirror images as between left and right hands. Further investigation on my part led me to discover that scientists make a clear, and for the purposes of this discussion, it seemed to me very helpful distinction between asymmetry and dissymmetry. Asymmetry is, as the dictionaries define it, a simple absence of symmetry. Dissymmetry, on the other hand, in scientific discourse, is a variation of symmetry. More specifically, it is the absence of symmetry in a context where one would normally expect symmetry to be present. And from this, I deduce that Chenu's use of the word reflects his awareness. This is something I would have to investigate a lot further, of course, but I, this is, for the purposes of my paper, I hope that, that it's a starting point, uh, uh, something that um, raises questions and throws it into an arena. And what I think that he may have meant uh, was he, that, the, that his use of the word rather reflects his awareness of the potential Japanese ha, uh, art had to, to surprise or even shock European eyes. Unlike asymmetry, dissymmetry thwarts expectations in a scientific and mathemat mathematical context. It's a quality that causes the beholder to question. A work of art, it seems to me, in which that quality is present is one that is bound to disconcert. According to a Japanese art critic, Inaga Shigemi, Hokusai's wave illustrates dissymmetry more vividly than anything else he produced. It is, according to this uh, uh, writer, the most striking illustration Hokusai offered to theorists of dissymmetry. And from a different perspective, but also focusing on the element of surprise that Western artists discovered in Hokusai, the great Japanese print uh, expert Jack Hillier talks about the knife edge between reality and abstraction that Hokusai steers in his prints. To us, and I quote uh, from Hillier, with a background up to the time of Hokusai's impact upon Europe, 
of representational method of landscape painting culminating in the quasi-scientific experiments of the Impressionists, Hokusai's prints seemed to have achieved in one bound that compromise between the representation of actuality on the one hand and the creation of an abstract design in color and line satisfying in itself on the other that was the eternal problem of Cezanne and many artists since. Earlier, I mentioned this photograph, possibly taken by Satie, and in the background, as I also said, I um, jumped ahead in my uh, script, uh, but the um, uh, prints are in the background on the wall. And it's not, not infrequently said that uh, and certainly I've read it uh, more times than I've read anything else, that uh, Debussy used Hokusai's wave on, his, on the 1905 edition of his La Mer. Or, alternatively, people say he used a section of the uh, Hokusai. But in fact, he didn't. He didn't do either. He might have done, given that it was on his wall, but in fact he didn't. What appears on the 1905 score is an adaptation of Hokusai. We heard yesterday how very particular and obsessive even Debussy was about how his scores looked. And he certainly insisted on having this uh, print on, on the cover. And unfortunately, we have no information about it. There are no letters to Durand, to his publisher. There's no name for the adapter. And what strikes one first, looking at it, is, in fact, how the, the similarity. But then a closer look reveals very significant differences. Hokusai is, of course, highly stylized. And he's not trying to be realistic, and that was part of his attraction for the, these avant-garde artists. But he's telling a story nonetheless, and it's a story that we can relate to as human beings. He lived, Hokusai himself, lived in terror of the sea, surrounding, oops, sorry, uh, surrounding his country on all sides. And the wave tells the story of that terror. There in the, in, in the curve of the wave is a boat. And in the, little bo in the boat are little fishermen aghast at what is, at, at impending disaster, at what's about uh, to happen to them. And also in the background is Mount Fuji, which locates it in, in Japan. But Debussy has got rid of all these things. What I do find interesting is that he places his name, and somebody said yesterday that he doesn't, uh, he often doesn't want his name on the cover, but he places his name in the same, uh, admittedly the um, direction it goes in is different, but in the same place that Hokusai has written, has signed this print, Debussy has put his name at the top, and La Mer, of course, uh, the title is also uh, very visible. But he's got rid of the boats, He's got rid of the fishermen. He's got rid of Mount Fuji. And we're left with a wave that has no story to tell. Unless, of course, you know the original. And we all do. Debussy famously said that his memories of the sea played a more important part in writing La Mer than did the actual sight of the sea. He finished it out of the sight of the sea. And that point of view is surely echoed in this adaptation of the Hokusai print. It places the music on the knife edge between reality and abstraction, on which Hillier places Hokusai's prints. It invites us as listeners, as players, as conductors, to negotiate the same knife edge. It says simply, play it like this. Thank you very much.
For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.